So welcome to the uh, Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Laws International Security Speaker Series. Uh, we are very, very fortunate uh, in our speaker today. You, know, you always know you have a good speaker come when you invite them and you're not sure are they going to talk about the future of U.S. relations with East Asia? Are they going to talk about the North Korean nuclear issue? Are they going to talk about vulnerabilities in the Straits of Hormuz? Are they going to talk about energy issues? You know that when you're inviting someone whose range of uh, expertise, knowledge, and breadth and depth of uh, learning is so vast that you're really going to be in for a treat. So I honestly didn't know. We weren't sure what you were going to talk about because there's such a great uh, list of options to, to speak from. And that's just one of uh, Professor Lin's great qualities. Another great quality, and we were talking about this earlier, is I think we all recognize that there's often this gap between uh, the ivory tower and public discourse. That a lot of things that are said among the egghead class doesn't really translate very well into meaningful and important policy debate. Uh, Jenny Lin has done as much as anyone, which is truly remarkable uh, given the place she is in her career, uh, to bridge this divide. Someone who has not just written for the top journals such as International Security, published in the top presses, Cornell University, Cornell University Press, but also makes a real effort to engage a larger audience with terrific articles in the Atlantic. She had a wonderful op-ed uh, in the New York Times about a month ago, a fascinating story about a visit of then Senator Robert Kennedy, or I guess Attorney General Robert Kennedy's visit to Japan uh, that beautifully highlighted uh, some of the sort of delicate intricacies in the U.S.-Japanese relationship. And so we're really very, very happy, proud, and privileged to uh, have Jenny Lin uh, with us today. Jenny's got an extraordinary background. She is a professor at Dartmouth uh, College. She was trained and got her PhD at the MIT Political Science Department in the Security Studies Program. And among a long list of published um, works, uh, perhaps the one you should uh, really check out because it's extraordinarily important, is her book that she published with the Security Series in Cornell University Press, which is called Sorry States, Apologies in International uh, Politics. It's a book that examines the effect of war memory and international reconciliation. Very, very important book. Today, she's going to be teaching us, or teaching us and talking to us about the strategic logic of resource nationalism. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Jenny Lin to the University of Texas. very, very kind introduction. Uh, this is my first visit to Austin, so I'm very excited. And I was walking around this morning in shorts with my little pale, pasty New England legs sticking out and looking completely inappropriate for you know, everybody else looks normal and tan. Um, so you can imagine how excited I am to be here when it's still a little chilly at home. So today I'm going to be talking about a subject that's very dear <coughs> to, to Texan hearts, which is which is oil, and with respect to East Asia and competition for oil in particular. So China's effort to gain control over the oil that it imports has gained it has, has led to a lot of debate in recent years. So many people are saying that the U.S. and other big importers of oil should be alarmed about China gobbling up or hoarding oil. These are the kind of verbs that they use in the media. Uh, China's trying to gobble up all the oil supplies in the world, and, and China's efforts to own oil, uh, to negotiate long-term contracts with countries like uh, Iran, Angola, Sudan, uh, all over Kazakhstan. Uh, this disadvantages other energy imports. Um, other analysts say, no, don't, don't get so excited. Uh, this, this policy of what people refer to as resource nationalism, neo-mercantilism, is, is kind of a flawed one. That, that China's actually not increasing its energy security by doing this. So this brings us to our question of interest, which is, do China's policies of resource nationalism actually provide it with any gains in energy security? And by extension, does this 
policy of resource nationalism threaten U.S. interests and, and threaten the ability of the U.S. and its allies to possibly impose sanctions or more drastic measures on China in the future in the event of some sort of a conflict or war, most likely over Taiwan. And increasingly, people are saying the South China Sea. In my talk today, I'm first going to talk about the debate as it stands between people who make the case for resource nationalism versus the people who argue that countries are just best served by relying on the free market to access the oil that they need. And then I'm going to talk through what are the various policies of resource nationalism that the countries might pursue, and I'll talk about the ones that China is pursuing. And then I'll turn to the question of, so how does this work? How does resource nationalism, how do these various policies confer greater energy security upon a country? And I'm going to talk about four different conditions, or four different environments in which an oil importer might find itself. And I'll describe, so how does, in these different environments, how does resource nationalism uh, benefit or not benefit a country in those four different conditions? All right, so here's the debate so far. So resource nationalism version 1.0. Say, so what, what are they saying? Uh, people say oil is a critical resource, and it's a dwindling, increasingly scarce resource. It's a resource that tends to be produced in unstable regions, uh, very, very prone to disruption because of internal conflict and other conflicts. And so what this means is you don't want to rely purely on the market for this oil. Uh, what you want to do is you want to own the oil in the ground as best you can. Remember, we're talking about energy importers here. So you want to negotiate contracts with the, the major oil-producing countries to own oil concessions in those countries. So no matter what happens in the market, you can call upon your oil and bring that home. And where you can't own the oil, you want to have long-term contracts at affordable prices. All right, so that's the resource nationalism view. And the free marketers, on the other hand, poke all sorts of holes in that view, poke all sorts of holes in those arguments. They say, Sure, we're worried about these kinds of disruptions, but, but none of this actually matters. Uh, there's a world market for oil, and today and tomorrow, oil goes to the highest bidder. So if a disruption occurs, it doesn't matter if you own oil in Venezuela or Angola. If you want it, just bid a high enough price, and you'll get it. You're going to pay those prices, regardless of whether or not you own it or regardless of whether or not you bought it on the spot market. And the free marketers appear to be right on logical grounds. If you're looking at normal market conditions, it really does appear to be true that oil follows price, that oil goes to who bids the most for it. But this leads us to two questions. First of all, are there circumstances under which the distribution of oil is not determined by price? Okay, and then secondly, we want to know, do these policies of resource nationalism help countries in those kinds of circumstances, all right? So the way to understand this, we want to first more carefully articulate what, what is the resource nationalist view, and secondly, we want to think deductively and then try and support empirically whether or not resource nationalism does seem to help in those kinds of conditions. So let me talk about the, let me develop the logic of the strategic logic of resource nationalism. So I'm going to talk about four different pillars here. And these pillars represent different stages of the oil supply chain. The first pillar is to cultivate political influence with the oil producing countries. So producers are constantly making decisions about how much to produce from their fields. And even if they have contracts with oil companies in place to produce a certain amount, a producer nation could abrogate those contracts if it so chose. So if there's an, an international embargo, for example, a producer nation could choose to conform to that embargo, or it could choose not to conform and choose not to abrogate those contracts. So close political ties between an importer and the producer country 
might sway this calculation, might sway that decision, and affect the producer's receptivity to bids for, um, uh, for, for bids from that country's oil companies. Okay, say, all right, we're friends now, we like you. Let's, let's do business together. All right, so that's the first pillar. The second pillar is that countries would like to control or influence the oil companies that extract oil from the ground and send it to the distributors. Okay, so the oil companies as opposed to the producing states. During oil shocks that reduce total supply, an oil company may have a lot of power, but a lot of say in who gets the reduced amount of oil. So for example, in the 1973 oil shock, the major oil companies were, were facing a 5% production cutback by some of the, um, the Arab members of OPEC. And they had to decide, okay, we've got 5% less oil than we thought we were going to have. And how are we going to apportion that shortfall? So the oil companies matter. You want to try and affect their calculus if you can. And similarly, oil companies might also have latitude to comply or not comply with an oil embargo. Uh, they may be beholden to their home governments, and their home governments might legally prevent them from selling oil to an embargoed state. And at the very least, if you're an oil importer, you want that there's oil out there that's being produced by companies that are not loyal to other states, right? Uh, and that are minimally susceptible to the influence of those states. And at best, a country wants oil companies <coughs> out there that are loyal to you and would, would basically do uh, what you're telling them to. All right, so that's the oil companies. The third pillar of resource nationalism is to wield control or influence over the transportation of oil. A country wouldn't want all of its import, oil imports to be coming in in a way that could be cut off either physically or through an embargo. And also, the transport companies might be susceptible to the kind of state influence that I mentioned. So tanker fleets and the companies, or sorry, and the countries with influence on them might have substantial latitude to either comply with an international embargo or not, and to, bro to break a blockade or not. And so you're concerned about the control or influence over the transportation of oil and getting that to your shores. And then the fourth pillar is to stockpile oil, to, to build strategic petroleum reserves that could provide short-term relief in the event that a disruption occurs. All right, let me talk now about China and how China is, is doing these various policies. So the first pillar, reaching out to oil-producing nations. Um, Beijing has engaged in energetic diplomatic activities aimed at building close relations with oil exporting countries. And this would include state visits by high-level Chinese leaders, at which leaders frequently offer trade agreements, uh, weapon sales, and generous foreign aid or loans packages offered to the, the leaders for domestic infrastructure, for example. And as the cartoon here shows, uh, Beijing is rather notorious for its no-strings-attached policy of doing business. So unlike many other uh, international institutions or, or many other liberal democracies, Beijing doesn't care what you do with the money, uh, how you distribute the money, uh, what you do with the big arm packages that, that they transfer, and so forth. So the, the no-strings-attached policy is, is um, unusual. <coughs> The, the powerful uh, participants in the oil industry. All right, the, the next pillar is the oil companies. So Beijing is worried that there will be companies controlled by or under the sway of hostile governments, which would deny oil sales to China in the event of an embargo. So Beijing wants to make sure that there's oil companies out there that would be willing to do business with China that will sell China oil in those circumstances. 
So China owns its own national oil companies, or NOx, which although they're separate entities, are very susceptible to government control. The government has encouraged those NOCs via generous loans. Okay. I know it's so upsetting. About it. I know it's upsetting. Hold on. Um, so, so the the government has encouraged those NOCs to to do these very deals that I'm, I'm talking about of acquiring oil concessions in these various countries because many Chinese leaders are saying this is an important thing we have to do to protect China's energy security. We want to make sure that Chinese <coughs> oil companies have claims to pots of oil in the event that other oil companies won't sell to us in the midst of an embargo. And then furthermore, Beijing encourages joint ventures between its NOx and other NOx. Okay, so for example, there's refinery projects in China between Sinopec and Aramco, the, the Saudi Aramco, uh, under the hope that the, the Saudis wouldn't sanction their own, their own entity, right? They wouldn't cut off supplies to their own refinery. And this also provides China with some leverage over the Saudis. So these are expensive investments within China that have an implicit threat of nationalization in the event that the Saudis join an anti-Chinese coalition. Uh, and then as for the third pillar, China's been seeking greater control over the transportation of its oil. So in an effort to minimize the chances that Chinese oil shipments could be blocked, Beijing has been supporting the diversification of, of shipping routes. And for the most part, Chinese oil has come via sea. 80% of Chinese oil imports come across the sea. But it's supporting, the, the government is supporting the diversification of this increasingly to land. Many Chinese analysts have said that China has what they call a Malacca dilemma, referring to the Strait of Malacca, uh, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Which means that the, the vast majority of these Chinese seaborne oil imports travel through the Malacca Strait, which the Chinese fear is uh, vulnerable to piracy, terrorism, or closure by the, the U.S. 7th Fleet. So Beijing has supported the development of overland transport <coughs> that would bypass the Strait, even though overland transport is much more expensive and also far less flexible. And then finally, the Chinese government supports the construction of a Chinese-owned and Chinese-flagged tanker fleet. And this is viewed, again, as a more reliable means of transporting oil to China's shores, rather than relying on the big international carriers. Uh, finally, China is also pursuing a strategic petroleum reserve. It's in the second of three phases, and it's um, it's currently shooting for a 50-day supply of crude oil in the event of disruption. All right, what does this all tell us? So China's up to its ears in, in all of these different flavors of policies, basically. The free marketers say that, you know, with the possible exception of stockpiles, none of this really matters. Okay? Uh, it doesn't matter if the Sudanese and Venezuelans have good relations with the Chinese or not, uh, because the Sudanese and Venezuelans just sell their oil to China at market prices. And it doesn't make sense to, to get into the shipping business if you're China. You should just allow companies with comparative advantage in shipping to do that. And so you should just allow the big foreign tanker fleets to bring their oil to China if they're willing to do that. Now to evaluate the claims of the free marketers, we need to think about the various conditions under which the oil market functions. And we need to ask, well, how well does the logic of the free market arguments hold up in these different conditions in which oil importers might find themselves? So I'm going to talk about four different environments. So the first would be just the normal functioning oil market. This is a condition that we're, we're used to. Sure, there's lots of funny stuff that goes on in this market. <laughs> um, it's not a purely competitive market. There's a cartel going on. Uh, but basically, price determines the distribution of supply. P 
people are bidding on oil futures, people are buying on the spot market, people are signing long-term contracts. So the, the oil is flowing. Okay? Now what's striking is you can spend hours reading the free market arguments about oil and national security. And what they're not explicit about is that all of their arguments are assuming this condition. Okay, so the free marketers say, don't worry, oil follows price. But again, all of their arguments are based on normal functioning market conditions. But that's only one possible environment that we might find ourselves. Uh, the, the free marketers are right that when the, mar the market is functioning normally, the distribution of oil is for the most part determined by price. Um, even here we should note that the resource nationalism argument has some traction. Uh, we know that in exchange for close political favors and for security, oil producers might give a little bit preferential oil prices to their patrons. There's evidence that a little of that has gone on. There's evidence that uh, in the past the Saudis gave a small discount on oil to the U.S. oil companies. You know, the nature of about a dollar a barrel or something as a way of compensating the United States for its close military protection and, and political support. So there can be some benefits from having these close personal political ties uh, to oil producers, even in normal circumstances. Okay? But the, the big takeaway is, under normal market conditions, the free marketers are generally right. Okay? Oil follows price. Now, a second condition that oil importers might worry about is that of a global supply shock, right? a sudden shock, a sharp decline in global oil production. And this could be because of natural disasters, such as hurricanes that damage production equipment. Uh, it could be sub-state violence, such as terrorism or civil war that you know, damages pumping stations or the transportation of oil. Uh, and for example, we've been hearing quite a lot about a possible Iranian closure of the Strait of Hormuz in retaliation for, uh, you know, a Israeli or American uh, strike against Iranian nuclear facilities. So, so that could cause what, what people are worried about happening is that could cause a global supply shock. Supply shocks could also be caused by a coordinated supply reduction among producers, such as the, the 1973 OPEC cutback. And in a shock. You have all of these oil companies which have contracts with the producing nations that the producers are going to supply them with a certain amount of oil. And then the companies make agreements, they sign contracts with a bunch of companies, and they say, we're going to deliver that oil to you. But when a shock happens, there's going to be a shortfall. Okay? So the, the companies aren't going to get an adequate amount of oil to then satisfy all of the contracts that they have outstanding. So the companies can only make, say, 90 or 95 percent of their deliveries. So somebody is going to be short of oil. So the question is, who gets the oil? And, and what is the, the way that this is determined? How do we know how these supplies get allocated? So the answer is, they've got kind of three generic choices. So the, the first is the oil companies can claim force majeure, it's kind of a force larger than us, act of nature, or whoever, whoever speaks Latin can translate that for me. Uh, so they rip up their contracts, they have everyone bid for the smaller pot of oil. Okay, So that's the market solution, which is we thought we'd have this much oil, now we don't, so we're going to back to square one. We've got this much oil, so put in a bid for it. That's the market solution. Now, secondly, companies could not let the oil be distributed on the basis of price. They could decide that it's going to be distributed on the basis of kind of an equal misery idea, which is everybody gets a 5% cut in how much oil they thought they were going to get. No matter what your contracts say, you get a 5% cut in supplies. And the third option is to distribute oil on the basis of political connections or preference. And so what this means is 
the companies might declare equal misery for everyone, but that not all misery ends up being equal. So uh, everybody loses their 5%, except for a couple of customers <coughs> who don't. Now, the, the free marketers are implicitly arguing that price is going to drive the distribution of supply. That after a shock, whoever wants the oil the most will pay the most and will therefore get the oil. But at least theoretically speaking, that's not necessarily the way it's going to work. There are these other ways that the oil companies might choose to allocate oil after a shock. So what happens? Uh, the answer, so these are the three different solutions that we might see. The market solution, the equal misery, or preferential treatment. So what do we see? There's actually evidence for all three behaviors when you look at various supply shocks. Uh, there, there's always an element of the first, uh, as evidenced by the fact that some contracts are ripped up and some of the oil is put back on the spot market, uh, which is, the, again, the, the market mechanism. Uh, Daniel Jurgen has this great anecdote where he, he talks about, um, I think Shell had a contract in, uh, the, during the 1973 crisis for, you know, say, X hundred thousand barrels. And then uh, Shell was told, I'm sorry, we just don't have the oil for you. It's, you know, our hands are tied. There's this whole, you know, embargo going on. So sorry about this. And then an hour later, they got a fax from the same company saying, uh, we have X thousand barrels of oil if you would like to bid for it. <laughs> so again, this is, this is what happens. Uh, the oil is there, but the price terms are just going to change. Um, so we, we see evidence of this market solution that happens, but then we also see evidence of number two and number three. So for decades, the, the British government claimed that it got no favoritism from British Petroleum in the 1973 oil cutback. Um, for, for, for decades, the story was that the oil companies pursued this equal misery policy, and BP included pursued this policy of equal misery, even though the British government is a majority shareholder in BP. That's why they founded BP, is because they wanted preferential treatment. Right? Just like that's why China established its national oil companies, is because they wanted and expected preferential treatment. Now, there was this great story about this outraged British Prime Minister Heath, who, uh, who storms into the office of the, um, the BP executive and says, you must give us the oil. And the BP executive says, sir, I am beholden to my shareholders. I cannot give any one shareholder preferential treatment. It turns out it was a bald-faced myth that was made up. And that was the history for decades, until some historian was rummaging around the, the BP archives. Historians are good at things like that. And, and found that actually the, the oil executive and the prime minister kind of concocted this story <coughs> to, to kind of clear both of their names, because this is very, very bad behavior for either of them to have been involved in, right? Either leaning on this company, pressuring this company, or giving preferential treatment to shareholders. So they concocted this story that it was BP didn't give anybody preferential treatment. Um, what actually happened is BP agreed. Okay. So there, there was evidence that uh, British Petroleum gave uh, preferential treatment during the crisis to its home country. Now, to this point, nobody else has admitted that they succumbed to this kind of pressure. Again, it was only unearthed in this case because there was this, you know, this, this guy writing a book about BP who stumbled on this stuff in the archives. So um, at the time, though, all of these home governments in Italy, in France, um, all of them were really leaning on their national oil companies. So it's quite an interesting question to wonder what actually happened. Uh, so the bottom line of all this, in the environment of an oil shock, oil is not necessarily allocated by price, and having political ties to oil companies and producers can yield real benefits.
Now, the third condition that oil importers worry about, some more than others, <laughs> is being the target of an embargo. An embargo could be imposed by producer countries that refuse to sell oil directly to the target country, or refuse to permit their oil to be sold even secondhand to the target country. And alternatively, an embargo could be done by the, the countries that have substantial influence over the major oil companies or transport companies. Uh, but the first point, and the quite an, an obvious one, is that an embargo, by definition, is a circumstance in which oil is not allocated by price. And certain countries, at least, are, are denying oil to the target of the embargo. So just by definition, um, the, the free market arguments don't seem to apply here. So, so what does apply? Um, who gets oil during an embargo? Uh, during an embargo, access to oil depends on the willingness of producer states and companies to comply with the cutoff. So countries and companies may choose to uphold an embargo because of the many ways they might be punished by those running the embargo if they caught violating. Or they may choose not to comply with the embargo. And they may welcome the opportunity to produce for embargoed nations. The point is, is that ultimately, these are political decisions. Leaders of countries and companies will decide whether to participate or not. And policies of resource nationalism can persuade countries and companies to violate an embargo. So some analysts complain, well, this, this is kind of equating the companies with their home governments. And then it's, it's treating them as if they're just arms of governments when in fact they're not. Uh, it's a mistake to think of you know, CNUC or Sinopec as just you know, equivalent, equivalent with Beijing. But it, it's naive to think that they're, they're, they're certainly not equivalent, but it's, it's naive to think that they're not under substantial influence, certainly within China. And even in, in countries where there's very firm property rights, and the, the oil companies are not, in fact, national oil companies, but they're private entities. So if we have any doubt about this, we should read the descriptions of the conversation between the US Secretary of Treasury and the CEOs of the, the biggest, most powerful banks in the US in the midst of this 2008 financial meltdown. So the Treasury Department forced these companies to take loans and dictated the terms to them and reminded the bank leaders pointedly that there would be no negotiation and that, remember, you are speaking with your regulator. So uh, in times of crises, to, to paraphrase Henry V, nice companies curtsy before great kings. Blockades. Blockade is another environment that oil, uh, oil importers fear. They worry about an effort to physically stop one or more countries for importing cargo. It could be trade traveling by air, by sea, or by land. China feels very vulnerable to blockade by the U.S. 7th Fleet. Uh, China, may, China and the U.S. may come to blows over Taiwan someday. And China is a major exporter and a major importer, particularly, of energy. And as I said, 80% of China's oil comes over the sea. Now, China feels as if it has a Malacca dilemma, as I mentioned. Because the oil is coming through this particular choke point, so it's coming here from the Persian Gulf through this narrow channel and up here to China. China is worried about this Malacca dilemma, and Malacca being vulnerable to, as I said, piracy and terrorism, but also to the United States. So there's, there's two important questions to, to ask about a blockade. The, the first question is, is this even militarily feasible? Like, what, what, How would you do a blockade here? What's, what's this mission look like, and, and can the relevant players actually carry that mission out? It turns out that blockading China's oil is a really hard mission to do, even for the, the mighty U.S. 7th Fleet. 
The, the second question is whether China can convince oil companies and tanker companies to violate that blockade and to sell China oil. As in the embargo scenario that I mentioned, this is a political question. And this is, again, where resource nationalism can enter in. So Beijing would seek to use its political connections with producer states, with oil companies, and with tanker companies to convince them to try and violate that blockade. And if China has influence on these companies, perhaps because they're involved in joint ventures with China's firms, or, or even better, if they have billions of dollars in illiquid assets on the Chinese mainland, uh, like the Aramco refineries that I mentioned, perhaps China could reduce the odds that those companies would cooperate with the blockade. And even better, China could order its state-owned oil companies and tanker companies to violate the blockade. So let's sum this up. In the current debate, the free marketers argue that because price generally follows, oh, sorry, because price generally drives the allocation of oil, resource nationalism is a policy that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Critics of this talk about China's actually overpaying for oil. That this is kind of a foolhardy thing that they're doing. They come up with all these explanations why, why, why would China engage in this kind of strange policy? There's bureaucratic explanations. It's, oh, it's kind of corrupt state capitalism and it's worse. You know, there's all these, these explanations. But again, they're trying, they're, if they're implicitly focusing here on normal market conditions, what about other conditions? What about those conditions when oil does not follow price? In normal conditions, I think the free marketers are generally correct that price determines the allocation of oil. So the benefits of resource nationalism are likely to be mostly small. So free marketers are mostly right for the normal conditions, except for the some exceptions that I mentioned. Now, in the other three conditions, in the, the time of a global supply shock, or an embargo, or a blockade, oil is not distributed by the price mechanism. And so resource nationalism can provide bigger benefits and improve a state's energy security. <laughs> conclusions that we reach are, first of all, exactly this point, that resource nationalism can help countries secure oil supplies. With respect to China, what does this tell us? Well, in terms of oil shocks, it tells us that resource nationalism might help China a bit, that their relationships with the Sudanese, the Angolans, the, the Kazakhs might help China get preferential treatment. As for an embargo, China is not particularly vulnerable to an embargo today. They just don't import a huge amount of oil. They, they're, remember, they're an energy uh, oil producer as well. And for a long time, they independently satisfied all of their oil needs. Uh, as of 1993, they became a net importer. But still, they only import 4 million barrels per day. And so if you're only importing 4 million barrels per day, there are a lot of different suppliers in the world that you could cobble together four million barrels per day from. So the implication is that an embargo would have to get everybody's agreement. You'd have to get everybody on board to deny China such a small amount of oil. But China's situation, importantly, is likely to change. <laughs> Chinese economic growth means that more Chinese energy imports are coming in the future. As imports increase, they're going to be more vulnerable to cutoffs. And so when China needs 8 million barrels per day or 10 million barrels per day, suddenly an embargo would not have to include everyone in order to squeeze China. So in the future, a resource nationalism strategy, which ensures that, for example, Angola and Iran are in China's camp, would be increasingly valuable. What about blockade? So today, China is vulnerable. They know it. We know it. And we don't talk about it much, um, but everybody knows it. Uh, the US Navy can cut off Chinese energy imports. And an owning Canadian or Venezuelan oil is not going to help China out a whole lot. 
but as part of a long-term strategy to build the same kind of energy security that, for example, the U.S. enjoys, what China would need to do is to first develop its navy, so have a more capable navy, and secondly, have good relations with producers at the source who would not agree to a Western embargo. So a resource nationalism strategy is basically half of what China needs to do in order to inoculate itself from blockade threats in the long term. It's not the whole picture, but it's an important part of it. Now, when we talk about China doing all of these things, it sounds as if, you know, it sounds as if they're being really paranoid or, you know, they're thinking we're really aggressive. It sounds like a crazy Chinese overreaction. Uh, but let us understand, this is precisely <coughs> the U.S. strategy and has been for the past, you know, 40 years for energy security, which is a combination of, of close relations with energy producers and powerful naval forces to ensure that supplies get to our coasts. So if China wants the same kind of imperfect energy security that we have, it wouldn't be surprising if they went down this path. Now, what are the implications of all this? So is resource nationalism in the big picture good for China? Is this a smart policy for China? And should all importers of oil pursue resource nationalism? Well, in order to answer that, you have to also talk about the significant costs associated with resource nationalism. Uh, there's domestic political costs associated with this in, in China and in elsewhere, uh, associated with favoring the national oil companies, as we see, is, um, is, is a big controversial issue in China. The, the Chinese are very worried about what they call the interest groups taking over Chinese politics, and one of the first groups they point at are the energy companies. There are also strategic costs, because these policies, as I mentioned at the outset, they fuel distrust, they fuel competition among neighbors who are competing for energy imports. And then another reason why maybe not everybody would want to take this path is that if a country feels it has a particularly low risk of embargo or low risk of blockade, so if you're South Korea, if you're Japan, uh, it might not be worth it. So what our analysis suggests is there can be benefits associated with resource nationalism. But it's up to these individual countries to figure out uh, whether or not these benefits outweigh their many costs. There's another implication of this, which is the US has a foreign policy dilemma. That currently, the free market view says, hey, China's policy is, is not really affecting us in any meaningful way. Uh, it doesn't confer any additional energy security on China. Uh, but in this project, we argue it actually might. So the U.S. has to think about this. Uh, does the U.S. say, okay, we're just going to allow China to continue in this vein, which then reduces the ability of the U.S. and its allies to put pressure on China in the future, which many people in the U.S. think we will someday probably need to do over Taiwan, or as I said, the South China Sea. Alternatively, you could try and block Chinese efforts to build ties with energy producers, and thereby incurring Chinese anger, and fueling the same conflict that you had wanted to avoid in the first place. So the answer is not clear. But again, until we understand the strategic logic behind resource nationalism, it wasn't apparent that there was a foreign policy debate that needed to be had in the first place. So I'll stop there, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Thanks Jenny. That was, uh, that was really terrific. I opened up the questions. I have two questions that I want to ask you. Uh, the first, uh, one of the things that I strikes me as perhaps missing from your analysis of this resource nationalism is it had a very sort of 1970s feel where you were who controls the physical possession of the oil was really the key player. And I think one of the things that has transformed the energy industry is that 
and under that model, the private market, the companies have far less power. Today, I think one of the real issues is that a company like ExxonMobil, what they are is a technology company. They have the best technology in the world, and they're a finance company. You know, ExxonMobil controls less than 3% of the world's supply, yet they're capitalized at $700 billion. Luke Oil Seenook control more physical oil, but nobody wants to buy their stock. And in fact, there's a certain amount of leverage that a company like ExxonMobil has over the uh, nationalized companies because they can say, we have this technology, we have this ability to raise lots of money on the, on the capital markets, you can't. And in fact, one of the things that we've been seeing happening is the national energy, the nationalized energy companies trying to become more like Western companies because they know they can mess around and monkey around, but they'll pay a price because at the end of the day, if you're Venezuela or Russia, you can push people around, but you can only push ExxonMobil Mobil around so long or you won't get access to this technology and this capital and other companies call suit. So I wonder if you could reflect upon that, whether that's a, whether the game has changed a little bit from, say, the 1970s, where technology and capital was important. The second question, uh, the, national, the natural gas revolution. I can see this pulling in two different ways. One, diversified, diversified supply from more stable places. So that's kind of a good thing, uh, argues against resource nationalism. On the other hand, transportation much more difficult than natural gas and some of the factors that you laid out would actually argue you know, from what I gather there isn't there is not a global price of natural gas it's very much based on local contracts may could you comment on what this sort of this natural gas revolution that we're going through right now what effect that would have on your story yeah very interesting um, trying to uh, figure out how your first question fits in with our, our main arguments. Um, the the, the I mean, temptation one, to engage in resource nationalism in the 70s made sense, but now those who would engage in it would incur costs that might not be captured. They will not have access to capital markets or technology which will hurt them in the long run. So, so why would they have access? Because ExxonMobil is not going to make a contract with CNO if they don't play by by play by open capital market rules. And this has been shown that, that that as these nationalized companies have tried to raise money for their own product uh, projects, they can't get it unless they partner with a Western company. So the Western companies have huge leverage, or a lot more leverage than would be implied, and it makes pursuing a non-free market strategy problematic. Well, what I'm just saying is that the private companies might have more leverage in your story than this one on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is how it fits in in terms of basically in the paper what we do is we say we want to know if there are some benefits to be had from pursuing this strategy. Because, as I said, the, the free marketers out there which have dominated the debate, um, they, they said there are no benefits to be had. This is this is a costly policy. You're, the, the only thing you're doing is, is you're actually helping other energy importers because if you actually do go into these areas that you know in Nigeria or somewhere that the, the other oil majors have decided is too risky or costly or whatever to go into, that's a good thing because you're actually putting more oil on the market if you happen to find something. So, so the free marketers say this is just not a problem at all. If, if, if anything, that it's, it's oil that's going to be put on the global market, and the risk of that is being absorbed by Chinese shareholders. <coughs> so the free marketers actually say we like what China's doing, and you know, in terms of does it make sense for them? Probably not. So basically, I'm saying in the paper we said, is there actual benefits to be had? Are, are there energy security benefits to be had? And so we laid out the ones that we thought are there. Again, those benefits are at a time of, uh, of shock, at a time of non-normal conditions. So shocks, embargoes, blockades. But then the important question that I came to at the end, and I think where it fits in with yours, is but what are the, the various costs associated with resource nationalism? And if, if it is true that the cost and, and I mentioned some of them, and Frank's alerting me to another one, another potential cost of, of China or others following this strategy. 
if there are substantial costs in here, it would be economic costs to the competitiveness of your, your national oil companies. And that might be a good reason. That, that's certainly in the con column. And so you need to weigh that, uh, that the, the do this cost-benefit analysis and figure out, okay, just how scared of an embargo are you such that you're willing to sacrifice these economic gains for your company? And so, so I can't speak to, to this, but that's the category that I would put that in. And then, I mean, the other thing I can say is these, the, the Chinese cases in particular, these are not cash poor companies because they are getting loans from the state banks. So the, the government is just shoveling money at these companies. So they're, they don't have a problem when it comes to financing. They're the ones that are outbidding everybody for, for these projects around the world. So if, it, if the linkage here is that you're being deprived of financing, that doesn't seem to be a problem with respect to China. Well, and access to technology. They don't, they're the type of tech, oftentimes in these deals, Exxon Mobil's technology is even better than someone else. So getting access to that technology. Yeah, and the, the Chinese firms are very eager to partner with the, the big Western firms for with the oil majors for this exact reason. And so if, again, if this kind of behavior that's coming, if, if this kind of behavior is depriving them of opportunities to do that, that would be a significant cost. Natural gas? Oh, natural gas. So um, we have not looked at that market. And so the question is, is do, does kind of the same logic apply with other resources of interest, in, in this case natural gas? Um, China is a very low consumer of natural gas, and, and so this, is, this has not become a significant issue in Asia, which was kind of the motivating question for us. But, but certainly as respect to the U.S., uh, the more that the U.S. is relying on natural gas and also on domestic sources of oil, Obviously, this, this changes a lot to the U.S. calculus. But in terms of China, China is, um, it actually relies mostly on coal for its energy needs. Something like 71% of its energy needs come from coal. And, and China is very rich in coal. And so the oil is just a smaller portion of the Chinese economy. Um, but again, um, a, a very important one and an increasingly I'd like to follow up on the technology side. Um, the second element you talked about was the relationship to other companies. And oil in particular, and also natural gas, are becoming much more technical um, as the resources uh, require deeper oil drilling and uh, hydraulic fracturing, which itself is a very technical uh, issue. Um, I don't know if you want to call that nationalism or not, but it would seem to me following on this theme, that what China's trying to do with that second block is to gain access to that technology because these resources will become more and more difficult to extract. One final comment on the shale gas, there's a huge amount of shale gas in western China, and though they may not have much use for gas now, it's a resource that they will tap uh, in the future. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I think you're right. And in, in terms of the technology, um, this this gets at, in terms of your, your first comment, it gets at a really interesting debate that actually people are having within the China political economy literature, which is um, kind of who's who's driving this. So so I had all these examples of you know, here here are these Chinese policies that are going on. China's doing this, and it's bidding for oil fields in, you know, Kazakhstan, whatever. And, and there's a big debate about who, who wants this to happen, and, and kind of who's wagging <coughs> the dog, or is the tail wagging the dog, etc. So um, I, I think the, the first, the, the first kind of round of the debate on this about China's policies and resource nationalism was very state-centric and said. Again, just kind of equating Beijing with the oil companies and saying, oh, China wants to do this. And so China is doing this, and it's this very top-down strategy of resource nationalism. Um, and then there was a lot of reaction to characterizing it in that way. And, and many people who you know, understand the dynamics of the oil industry, they, they pointed out, well, wait a minute. The, 
the companies want to do these things. <laughs> so the companies like moving into the kind of upstream oil exploration and production sector because that's, that's where the money is. And so there's this debate about is this this kind of realpolitik's you know grand strategy that Beijing is is driving and, and telling its kind of acquiescent oil companies to do, or is it the other way around? So is it the oil companies have the government in their pocket basically, uh, and the oil companies are saying we want to do this because that's where the money is and that's where the technology is. So that's that's your point which is it benefits us to, to cultivate these ties, that second pillar, to cultivate all these ties and do these joint ventures and do all of that. So we want to do that. And then you hear about them kind of whispering in the ears of the, the government ministers saying, Malacca dilemma, Malacca dilemma, you know, and, and, and kind of uh, making the, the government afraid and, and, and also uh, getting their way via making these kind of threat arguments about Chinese energy security and energy vulnerabilities. So, so it's, it's a really good question, which is, as you're saying, you can think of competing reasons why, competing reasons for the behavior that we're observing, right? And so this, this is one, and then a more kind of top-down approach is, is one explanation, and then another approach is it's, this is what the companies want to do. <coughs> Let's turn it around a little bit. Uh, the world market sets the price of oil. How do you how do you do resource nationalism unless you're able to produce in your own country or offshore enough oil to make a surplus in the world? If you've got organizations like OPEC, the United States increased its production from 11 percent to 20 percent. OPEC countries and others were trying to reduce their output, and so, so the big, big hue and cry now about the United States being more, be, do more domestically to make us more secure. It won't make us more secure unless the price comes down or stabilizes. National security is a function of economic security. If the world market sets the price of oil, how much, how much the United States, if you will, how much more production they have to do on the shore to drive down the world market price? Um, I'm not, I think I get your question, but the, I mean, you're right that energy security is typically defined as adequate supplies of oil at sustainable <laughs> prices. And so if China as an energy importer wants to achieve energy security, there's a, there's a question about like, how, how much power does it actually have to do that through these kinds of policies. So it's a really good, really good point. Um, so again, the, the conditions that China is most interested in are these conditions of disruption in which it's seen as running afoul of, of the U.S. Or, or, or other industrialized countries, liberal industrialized countries, and is being sanctioned because of, again, so one of the things they talk about is there's like another Tiananmen Square kind of a moment where the, the Chinese are forced for domestic reasons to do some sort of a crackdown. And um, the, the Chinese Communist Party says, well, we have to we have to crack down on this. We know the rest of the world is going to like it. We may have to accept sanctions, but the case will be. So that's the kind of situation that, or a war over Taiwan, or that's the kind of situation where they're worried about. And so presumably they know they're probably going to be paying a larger price for oil under those conditions. And, and it might not be, I mean, so again, there's only so much energy security you can make for yourself if part of the definition of energy security is kind of acceptable levels of price. Um, but what they're trying to do is make sure that there's oil out there that they have claim to. And in doing that, there's it's, it's not like they're getting any sort of discount, right? Because if, if, if they've got this oil in you know, Angola, 
and they say, we're going to bring that home and use it, then that means they're not selling it on the international market, which if the price has gone way up, they're paying a very high cost for that oil. So there's absolutely no way, you're right, to, to steal yourself from the, 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 the basic fact that there is a global market price for oil. But, but they can at least know that there are supplies out there if at a rather high cost that they'll be able to access. Yeah, why don't, why don't we, we've got a bunch of other people. Why don't we try to see if we can collect three or four uh, questions in Celeste, Melissa, and at least Brian. Why don't we okay. I'll, I'll try to go fast. So you didn't say very much about the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. And so um, the strategies that you talked about are clearly only one aspect of what the Chinese are doing to provide for their own energy security, or oil security, because we're not talking about coal and all those other right. things. Um, so you would think that the South China Sea would be a perfect answer, because it gets you out of the Strait of Malacca problem, and it actually satisfies your fourth pillar, which is in-country stockpiles, or almost in-country stockpiles. That's a controversial so, way to say it. Well, yes, 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 I know, if you're Vietnamese or one of these other countries. So perhaps that's the Mexico reason. Yeah. Yeah, so perhaps that's why the, the reason why they haven't pursued this strategy more aggressively, although some would say they have been quite aggressive. But you just didn't say anything about it. So I was just curious about your thoughts of that being a piece of their strategy. Um, and also, if they get 71% of their energy from coal anyway, isn't one key strategy trying to reduce your reliance on oil generally? And so to what extent is that part of what the Chinese are doing? And in that connection, are we risking overplaying these other things they're doing, consorting with the Sudanese and the Angolans? Are we over-interpreting what they're doing? And this is a small aspect of a much larger energy security strategy. So, Melissa? Um, you touched or you mentioned how um, sort of China's policy and resource nationalism is basically what the U.S. has done, um, pretty much the same thing. I was wondering how China's sort of um, no strings attached method of doing that changes things. Um, what that sort of causes as far as differences are concerned between the, the China and the U.S. policy. Brian, we'll give you the last question. Uh, I think it's been basically answered. Okay. Um, lots of really great questions. Um, so so the, the South China Sea is just, you cannot talk about the South China Sea independent of energy. I mean, it, it is so bound up in that issue and for exactly the reasons that you say, which is China's looking down the line to being even more dependent on, on energy, specifically on oil, there's been all these estimates of resources around the South China Sea, and potential natural gas deposits, maybe oil. There's there's all this innovation in, in offshore exploration. I mean, this is another thing: is that you know, decades ago, sure, the South China Sea is there, but we didn't have the technology to actually access the oil that might be there. So technology is influencing why people are so interested in this territorial dispute as well, which is suddenly we maybe can not we, you know, people <laughs> can actually access the supplies that might be there. And we're getting better technology for, for, um, for, for figuring out, for estimating what is there in the first place and then for, for actually accessing it. Uh, I mean, there's, there's other, it, it, this is just a, a nightmare of a dispute. I mean, I study nationalism, um, identity issues, and then again, to tell the Chinese, like, no, we're going to take this territory from you. They don't like hearing that after a century of humiliation in the hands of the Japanese and the West, and so anything that even smells like losing territory is it does not go over well. And then obviously the, the Vietnamese, the Philippines, others, they have their own very strong sense of nationalism and fears of China. So this dispute is going to be a really, really tricky one to solve. And, and one of the reasons for that is, is because precisely of energy, and that all of these claimants to the South China Sea are, are increasingly reliant on, on more and more uh, oil and natural gas for their economies. Um, uh, in terms of, yeah, so, so what I've been talking about today, um, both res with respect to talking about energy and with respect to talking about China's policies towards energy, is a really small piece of the bigger conversations about energy. 
like I, I kind of joke with people, because everybody's working on like clean energy and sustainable energy and uh, you know green economies, and I say, oh, I'm, I'm working on like dirty stuff, <laughs> like dirty old, you know, old school. Like Sprague's like, oh, this is so retro. <laughs> so, um, so the, most of the conversations now are about sustainability and you know greening China's economy, and and there's absolutely just huge gains that China could make in terms of energy efficiency. Like they, they get like uh, I forget the, the numbers offhand, but um, it's something like they get a quarter of the economic output out of a barrel of oil that Japan does. I mean, it's just they have such monumental strides that they can make in terms of increasing how much they get out of a barrel of oil. And uh, just doing that, 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 this is what a lot of the Chinese energy analysts are saying, which is enough of this Malacca crap. You know? We have a lot that we need to be thinking about that would actually really help our energy security, like making ourselves more energy efficient. And um, also they talk about the domestic regulatory environment and price controls and all of these things that are going on that actually are, are, have a big effect on the availability of oil in China. And so the conversation is, is certainly much bigger than, than what I've alluded to here. But, but again, um, it's a very important debate both within China and, and within just conversations about East Asian international security because this is something uh, increasingly a trend we've seen in recent years and so it certainly merits our attention. Thank you very much, and it's a terrific presentation. Please join me in thanking you.